This Parsha podcast is dedicated in loving memory of Angel Stanley. May her soul be elevated in heaven. It's Parsha Shemini, a very memorable Parsha. And the Parsha is effectively broken up into two major sections. It begins on the Yom HaShemini, the eighth day. The tabernacle, we've been reading about the tabernacle for a very long time. We were told about the various ingredients, the materials needed to construct the tabernacle and all its vessels and vestments. Um, we were told about the implementation of that. And we told about all the sacrifices that are done in it. And at the end of the last week's parasha, we told about the seven days of inauguration. For seven days, Moshe served as the high priest. For seven days, Moshe assembled and di- disassembled the tabernacle every day. And he brought all the sacrifices. And now it's day eight. And this is the finishing of the tabernacle. It's the inauguration of the tabernacle. And now, from this point forward, Aaron and his descendants, they are the Kohanim. Moshe is going to take a step back. He's going to have a demotion to being merely a Levite, no longer a Kohen. And finally, all the hard work is paying off. It's the first day of Nisan. All this incredible effort is now bearing fruit. Aaron offers the sacrifice. A fire descends from heaven. Everyone is wowed and everyone rejoices. This day, which begins with unprecedented ecstasy, is marred with one of the greatest tragedies of our history when the two prized jewels of our people the two heir apparents of Moshe and Aaron, Aaron's two sons, Nadav and Avihu, they bring an unauthorized sacrifice and they die on that very same day. The same day that the tabernacle is finally inaugurated in, in, in the permanent way. This is the same day that we lose these two incredible princes of our people. That's part one of the Parsha. It tells the story of the inauguration and the various sacrifices. And what was done on that day, and of course, what happened with Nadav Naviyu, and the aftermath thereof. And part two of the Parsha tells us the laws of kosher and non-kosher. And I look back at previous Parsha podcasts for Parsha Shmini, and I looked at the past three years. In all three years, the, the podcast was dedicated to the first part of the Parsha, but I said this year... It's year eight. It's Yom Hashmini. It's the eighth year of the Parsha podcast. This is the year that we go a bit deeper, deep and deeper. And I want to focus today on the end of the Parsha, namely the laws of kosher and non-kosher. There are laws governing what we can eat and what we cannot eat, and they are detailed in our Parsha. And to begin, the sources tell us that this is the key, eating kosher, making sure that what you consume is proper. It's the key to spiritual life. It is the key to eternal life. Chapter 11 of the book of Leviticus, our Parsha, verse 2 tells us, speak to the Israelites and tell them, zos hachaya, this is the animal that you may eat from all the animals upon the earth. Now, if you read that, in English, you'll miss a nuance because there are there are two words in the verse that mean animal, but one of them is chaya and one of them is behema. Because in, in Hebrew, there are different words in Hebrew. In the language of the Torah, there are two different words for a domesticated animal. It's called a behema. And an undomesticated animal, which is called a chaya. And the verse ping pongs, it pivots. It transitions, it segues, from Chaya to Behema. Zosa Chaya, this is the animal, the Chaya, the animal, the undomesticated animal, that you may eat, meet Kol HaBehema, from all the animals, from all the domesticated animals. So if you read this verse in English, you might miss that nuance, but in Hebrew, you'll, wait a minute, we're talking about animals, the animals that you can eat, and animals that you cannot eat, and it tells us, initially, these are the animals, Chaya, that you may eat, and these are from amongst the behema, the animals that are on the earth. So why does the verse transition from the, you know, from one name of animal, from chaya to behema? 
That's a question to get us started. To get us warmed up over here. It's Wednesday morning. I'm in the Torch Center. It's kind of chilly outside. We need to get a little bit warmed up. Got to get the blood flowing here. Wake up. We have to wake up. A question to get started. So, of course, Rashi picks up on this nuance, and he tells us something very interesting. The reason why he uses the word chaya, Rashi tells us, to, to start the subject, the first introduction to the subject of kosher animals, kosher food. It's the word chaya. This is the chaya. This is the animal. Rashi tells us the word, the word chaya means an animal, but it's the same Hebraic root as the word chayim. Chayim means life. So it's it, it begins the discussion of kosher food with the word chaya, which is similar, which has the same root to the word chayim, to tell us that this subject has a lot to do with life. And he explains, the Jewish nation, we are cleaving to God. We are worthy, we are capable of life. When we say life, when the Torah says life, it doesn't mean life that ends. If you have a life, and then after 50, 60, 80, 100 years, well, there's no longer life, now there's death. Well, that's not life. That's temporary life. That's life, uh, you know, a little bit. The Torah doesn't give us any half measures. If it says life, it's a reference to life that does not cease being life. Our nation, Rashi tells us, we are capable of eternal life. The life of the soul, the life that does not expire with death, with so-called death. We have this capacity. And the reason why the Torah is telling us what we can eat and what we cannot eat. Well, we may think because, you know, this may be um, unhealthy, it may be bad for your cholesterol. It may be, I don't know, it's got a lot of, it's processed. It's got too much saturated fat. Now, now this trans fat, trans fat. And therefore it's bad to eat it. Actually, telling us something very powerful. We are in a good position to achieve life. And again, when the Torah says life, it means life that's not just temporary life. It's real life. And there are certain things that can imperil our ability to have permanent life. And therefore, we are told to avoid things that may imperil, that may damage our prospects of eternal life. And we have these mitzvos. And the purpose of this mitzvos is to best position us for chayim, for life. And then he cites the analogy, the, the parable in the Midrash. The Midrash tells us that there was, there was a physician. The physician had two patients. And one of them, he says, this patient's going to die. So he tells his family, he can eat whatever he wants. It doesn't matter. He could binge on unhealthy food. It doesn't matter. And then he says the other one, the other one is he's sick, but there's still the possibility of salvation. They could be salvaged. And then he says, no, he's got to be on a very strict diet. This he should eat, this he should not eat. And of course, the onlookers are saying, wait a minute. Why to one patient, patient are you telling him that you could eat whatever you want? Another one, you're giving him a very regimented very restricted diet. So the doctor explains, one of them is destined to have life. And therefore, it's important to to not corrupt that, to not imperil that. And therefore, I'm giving him the, the proper diet to position him for life. But the one who's going to die anyhow, give him to eat, let him eat, let him enjoy. He's dead anyhow. Might as well not restrict any food from him. The Almighty is telling us, this is what Rashi is highlighting, we have the capacity for eternal life. And therefore, our diet must be very regimented. We cannot, just like, you know, if you have an athlete, the athlete, the, the athlete wants to be at, you know, peak performance. And they can't just binge on, on junk food. That's going to imperil their career. 
It may cost them millions in potential earnings. We have a potential career as a spiritual athlete. We're capable of eternal life. And what we eat will affect that. And it starts off, Zos HaChaya, this is the Chaya. Again, it uses the term that means life. We can be positioned for eternal life. And therefore, we're told all about the things that we must avoid. Because that can cause death. That can threaten our objective of eternal life. This is an amazing introduction to the subject. And when we talk about the Jewish dietary requirements, what we're allowed to eat and what we must avoid, Rashi is getting us started here by saying this is very important. This is critical because we have the capacity, we have the ability, we have all the ingredients, all the necessary factors and variables in place to have life. And again, when Thor says life, it means life forever. Not just relative life for a couple of years. And the way to do it is to eat kosher. And the Talmud tells us that when, when the verse says in our parsha to not corrupt ourselves with non-kosher food, even though the verse says, it's meisimah, you'll become impure through them, instead it's, or in addition, it's coming to indicate, v'nitam tembam, you will become dulled by it. The Talmud tells us that just as there is the, the possibility of having a clogged artery. Someone has, God forbid, someone has, you know, part of the pipes in their body. There's a blockage, God forbid. If there's a blockage in one of the arteries, you're in big trouble. If there's a blockage, you could have a stroke. If there's a blockage, you could have, God forbid, a heart attack. We need those pipes to be free and clear of any obstacles so that way the flow of the blood can go unimpeded. The Talmud tells us that that works on a spiritual level as well. And just as if you eat, you know, the not the right kind of food, unhealthy food, it could block your physical arteries. If you eat unhealthy spiritually food, you eat non-kosher, God forbid, it will clog the spiritual arteries their spiritual cholesterol that blocks the capacity of insight, that clogs up the portals of understanding. We have the ability for eternal life. Just as life over here, there is a requirement to have these pathways. You have to have these pathways, the veins and the arteries and the capillaries. It all has to be clear. If there's blockages, you're in trouble. On a spiritual dimension, there are also these pathways. And just as the physical cholesterol can clog up physical arteries, spiritual cholesterol can clog up spiritual arteries. And what does that? Not the food's nutritional content, but the spiritual content of the food. Kosher food, well, that makes sure that the arteries are free and clear. And non kosher food, the Talmud tells us, that creates spiritual cholesterol that imperils our ability to live on a spiritual dimension. And that's why it's so important. If we want life, this is again the introduction to our subject, if we want life, and again, by the Torah's definition of life, if we want that, we must eat the right diet, the balanced diet, the feeding diet that is conducive to this goal. We want spiritual life. We must open those pathways. Without these pathways, well, the entire spiritual agenda is impeded. I read an amazing story this week. There was a family that was fortunate enough 
to hear a lecture or a series of lectures about the divinity and veracity of the Torah. We, of course, know that the Torah is divine. It's from Hashem. It's the law of God. And therefore, it towers above all other laws. And it's baked in to this entire creation that God made. In fact, we know that the Torah, that's the blueprint for creation. And therefore, we, we, we want to study it. We want to understand it. We want to know how can we implement it. Every mitzvah that the Torah contains, every commandment, we're thinking, okay, how can we fulfill it? Because after all, it comes from God. There was a family that they were secular, which means that they did not grow up with this understanding, with this recognition. But they were fortunate enough to go to a seminar and they consider the question, is the Torah actually legit? Is it divine? Is it true? Or is it a hoax? And they heard the evidence. And the evidence was so compelling, they accepted it. They came to the realization that the Torah is true. It's divine, and therefore it is immutable, and it is binding. And they were thrust into a major dilemma. They were given a big problem. Because up to that point, they were living a very secular life. And now they got a big problem. Oh, no. They realize logically that the Torah is true. And that means you're in big trouble because you've got you to live a life that's compatible with that. And their whole life was not compatible with that. So what to do? They were faced with some dissonance because what they knew in their head did not match with how they lived. So they came to the rabbi and said, listen, we, we, we cannot become fully religious and observant. It's just, it's just not going to happen. But we, we, we realize it's true. So here's what we're going to do. We're willing to accept one mitzvah. One part of the Torah that we're going to keep it 1,000%. We're going to follow 100%. And that will assuage some of those feelings of guilt that we have that, you know, we're not keeping the Torah that we know is now, that we now know is divine. So this rabbi says, oh, okay, well, which myths do you want, you want to keep? And they respond, well, whatever you tell us. And uh, he doesn't know what to do. So he goes to the great rabbi, the greatest rabbi of the generation. He goes to Rabbi Shach. And he presents this question to him. They're willing to accept to completely obey one mitzvah in the Torah. Should I tell him to keep Shabbos? After all, Shabbos is one of the mitzvahs that are equal to all 613 mitzvahs combined. And that's the testimony that God created the world. And of course, Shabbos is so serious. Should have them study Torah every day, of course. The study of Torah is equal to all the mitzvahs combined. Should they wear tzitzis? Should they give charity? What should we do? So Rabbi Shach tells him, have them keep kosher. Only eat kosher food. And the rabbi was a bit surprised by that. This was in Israel. Most of the food's kosher already. And the ones that are not kosher... Well, you know, how severe is it compared to the violation of Shabbos, God forbid? Violation of Shabbos, that's a capital offense by Torah law. I keep it kosher, it's important, of course. But compared to Shabbos, it's not as severe. So the rabbi tells him, these people, their mind, their brain, their soul, is completely accepting the reality of the divinity of the Torah. What's the problem? The problem is, is that they're, they're just, they, they just cannot see themselves. They cannot fathom that they're going to actually keep all of Torah. Every mitzvah, every jot and tittle, every little kutso shel yud, in the words of the Talmud. The little, the little seraph on top of the yud, the smallest little jot and tittle of the law. They can't see themselves doing it because after all, they view themselves as secular and their whole family knows them as secular and the whole community knows them as secular and they have to learn everything and it's so overwhelming. There's 
a blockage between their brain and their heart, between what they know and between what they're willing to do. We're told in the Torah, the Talmud tells us, when the word says, when it's you become impure, it's, it's also indicating that you'll have a blockage. If you have kosher food, that will clear away blockages of the heart. Tell them to keep kosher. And once they do that, then the portals, the pathways, connecting their, their soul and who they are and how they live, those pathways will be opened. And then they'll come around to everything. That was the great rabbi's advice. And indeed, the story I read tells us they accepted to keep kosher 100%. And after some time, they said, you know what? Torah is true. Torah is legit. We'll observe it all. Once those pathways were wide open, everything else now can make its way through. If the heart's clogged up, if it's impenetrable, then none of the spiritual riches can penetrate. And this is why it's so important, because really all of life, all of spiritual life, hinges upon this. It all relates to this. It all depends upon this. Absent open pathways, if someone is riddled with spiritual cholesterol, well, then nothing else will matter because you can have all these incredible insights and understanding and concepts, but it won't get through because there's a blockage. And just as there are physical heart attacks when there's blockages and the life, the vitality, the oxygen cannot get to the heart and get to the rest of the body, that can happen on a spiritual dimension. Zos hachai, this is the life. You want life? It depends upon this. It's interesting, the Talmud tells us in many places that the Almighty offers spiritual protection to the righteous. And it tells us that the Almighty protects the righteous, not just them, but their possessions as well. Their animals won't sin. The Almighty is going to intervene and prevent their animals from sinning. And it gives a memorable story about the great Rabbi Pinchas ben Yair. His donkey was stolen by a group of ruffians. They steal the donkey, and, um, well, now they have a new donkey. So they want to make sure that it's well fed, right? So they try to feed it, but for three days, the animal refuses to eat. So it's obviously going to die soon, and they don't want this carcass of this dead donkey in their possession. So they said, okay, we're, let's wash our hands from this. Let's, Send it off. So it goes back to its owner. And it's famished. So the great rabbi tells his people, feed it. Three days and eat. So they quickly grab some some animal fodder, some barley, and they give it to the animal. And again, the animal, animal doesn't want to eat it. So the rabbi says to To his people, are we sure that this barley is fully tithed? Because if it's not fully tithed, it shouldn't be eaten. So uh, the people respond to him, says, wait a minute. There is a halacha that you taught us. There is a law that you told us. That if if there's a, a doubt as to whether or not animal food is tithed, so we may be tithed, maybe not be tithed, may, may not be tithed, so humans can eat it, but animals can. And this particular barley, it is this type of food where we're not sure if it was that we, we bought it and we don't know was it tithed already or not. So for a human to eat it, the human can eat it because we have to we have to know for sure that it was tithed. But for an animal, you taught me that you taught us that it does not have to worry about 
about food that may have been tithed, may have not been tithed. And therefore, should eat it regardless. So the rabbi explains this, you don't understand. I'm of the opinion that if there is demai, there's this questionably tithed food, the animals can't eat it. But my, but my donkey, it's more stringent than I am. And therefore, it's not going to eat it unless it's really tithed guaranteed. So they tithed it and the animal ate. So even though the animal was, was three days without eating, and the halacha is that it can eat this potentially tithed food, it says, no, no, no I want to know for sure that it's tithed. And the Talmud uses this as an example that an animal is an animal, and a donkey is a donkey. But when it comes to the great sages, the Almighty made sure that they don't do evens. Even the animals don't do sins. The sources point out that we have this theme featured many places in the Torah that the, the, the sages don't sin and their animals don't sin. But we have other examples where the sages did sin. This is the famous story the Talmud tells us of Rabbi Ishmael. You may be surprised to learn that there's a great rabbi named Rabbi Ishmael, especially because Ishmael, well, he's the half-brother of Isaac, and we have some problems, well-documented, with him. But the Talmud tells us that well, we know that Ishmael actually repented, and it is actually a name featured in uh, in our sources. Some of the great sages were called Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael. Ismail, as they say. So it tells us that he was one studying on Shabbos. And this is before electricity. This is 2,000 years ago. And the sages, they made a decree that you cannot study on Shabbos by candlelight. Why? Because what's going to be when the, when the oil begins to get depleted, you may feel an impulse to tip, tip the, the candle. So that way the wick is more firmly entrenched in the oil. So you'll have a better flame. And of course, that's a real violation of Shabbos. And the sages came and they said, well, don't even read unless there's someone there to watch you. Unless you have someone to watch you to make sure you don't tip, tip the, the jar of oil and thus violate Shabbos. You cannot read it. You cannot read to the, to candlelight on Shabbos. So this great rabbi, Rabbi Ishmael, the Talmud tells us, he says, ah, I'm fine. I'll study and I will not tip the candle. And he studied and he actually tipped the candle. And then he wrote in his, in his ledger, in his diary, he says, when the temple is rebuilt, I will bring a sacrifice, an atonement sacrifice for my sin of violating the Shabbos. So the company says, wait a minute. How could he tell me that the sages, the Almighty will make sure he will take preventative steps to, to, to ensure that they don't, God forbid, violate the Torah? And even their animals don't. We see a story here of the great rabbi who did violate the Shabbos. And why didn't the Almighty prevent that? And the medieval sages tell us that the truth is the righteous, even they are vulnerable. Even they can make mistakes. And the mighty will not necessarily intervene to prevent them from making a mistake with one exception. When it comes to matters of food, where there's a potential of a sage or even the animal of a sage to eat non-kosher, that is so shameful. That is so destructive. That is such an embarrassment. That's such a moment of ignominy to eat non kosher. There they might have intervene and prevent the righteous, their sages, and even their animals from eating non kosher. This is a further illustration of this idea. You want life. The prerequisite of life, is making sure that you don't have any of this spiritual cholesterol clogging up your spiritual arteries and veins and pathways. You want life. This is the first thing you need to do. Now, it is interesting that our Parsha, after it finishes the day eight of inauguration, the very next subject is the kosher and non-kosher. Which animals are kosher? Which animals are not kosher? 
And it's like the first thing we've talked about, you know, in many, many chapters. Chapter 25 of Exodus, that's when we started learning about the tabernacle and all the laws. And we had, of course, the few chapters of the golden calf in between. But we've essentially discussed the tabernacle and everything that relates to that tabernacle nonstop since chapter 25 of Exodus. And now the tabernacle is finally inaugurated. And the first thing we learn about is what are the qualifications of a kosher animal? And the question is why? Why is this the first thing that we learn? What's the connection between the tabernacle and kosher and non-kosher food? So the Sephardah, one of the great commentators on the Torah, he explains that the, the plan was after Sinai, at Sinai, the Almighty tore open the heavens. And there was this touch point of heaven and earth. And the world was awash in holiness. And at that point in time, the Jewish people were elevated to such a lofty and grand state that they were capable of experiencing the divine presence anywhere. And they didn't even need a tabernacle. They did not need a temple. They did not need any sort of intermediary, any sort of implements or vessels to be able to summon, so to speak, the divine presence wherever they went, wherever they uttered the name of God. That would be a place of complete holiness. That's what it was at Sinai. That's what it will be in the future. And that was the plan. However, they did the sin of the golden calf. And after the sin of the golden calf, God says, I'm not interested in you. God was repulsed by us. And he was not interested in having his shechina, his divine presence amongst us at all. And Moshe began to pray. Moshe began to intercede. And he was successful. But he was only partially successful. The Almighty says, okay, I'll, I'll give in. I'll grant you that I will still rest my shechina, my divine presence amongst you but only in one location and only via a mishra on a tabernacle and a very specific set of vessels and vestments. And they did it. And they spent chapter 25, 26, 27, 28, the rest of the Exodus and up to our parasha to follow exactly the specific requirements that the Almighty laid out. And they did it. And now it's time to make sure that the people are worthy of maintaining this and perpetuating this. And the first thing they tell us is, is okay, you want this? You want God amongst you? The very first thing we were told is how to be holy, how to be worthy of a divine presence. It's not enough to have a holy, elevated mind the soul, the spiritual parts be ready to be primed for this experience, you also must maintain a holy and refined body. The commentaries tell us, you are what you eat. When you eat something, what happens to that food? It assimilates within you. It becomes part of you. So, by you choosing what you eat, you're choosing what you want to become. And if you, God forbid, choose to become things that are vile in the eyes of God, that are antithetical to anything spiritual, well, then you're choosing to become someone, something that's not compatible with the divine presence. By the way, this is the, the moral case for eating animals. Some people may say, well, you know, animal, thats it's a life, and why should I kill the animal to eat it? And of course, we know, well, we do that because that's what the, the Torah allows us to do. But the logical moral case for it is the following. When you eat something, you essentially merge with that thing. It's m and mergers and acquisitions. You've merged, you've blended, you've fused. You've become an amalgam of what you were previously and what you've consumed. So you have an animal. The animal is on a lower level than human. 
The animal's not capable of abstract thought. The animal's not capable of overriding its instinct. The animal's not capable of verbal communication. The animal's not capable of connecting to the Almighty. The animal's not capable of having free will, making choices, and overcoming challenges. The human consumes the animal, and now the animal's part of the human. And the animal's been elevated. It's been upgraded. Now it's part of a human. And thus, its state has improved. And by the way, just as an extension of this, if someone is not righteous, there are sources that say they're not allowed to eat meat. Because if, if all they're doing is sins, then the animal, well, it wasn't a sinner before it was merged with this body. And now it's, it became a sinner, it became worse. And thus, it is a degradation, a demotion for the animal to be part of this human. Because the animal's the animal. It's not great, but at least it's not sinning. The human, now it's part of this new human. Well, now it's worse. And therefore, what's the moral case for killing animals to eat them? It's only, there's, there's only a moral case to kill animals to eat it if it's going to be an elevation, an upgrade for the animal. And if the person's wicked, the person is now bringing the animal on board, so to speak, to do sins with it, well, it's not fair to the animal. That's a side point based upon this concept that you are what you eat. The Sforno continues and tells us, there are some things, there are some animals that have elements of cruelty in them, and they are composed of character maladies. And thus, by consuming them, you're adopting and assimilating within you those qualities, and that will render you someone who is just not a candidate for the divine presence. We want life. We want spiritual life. And we just had so many chapters about this idea that we're, there's still room for salvation. We did the gold calf, yes, but even us, thanks, of course, to Moshe's prayer, even us, we can have the divine presence amongst us. And now we're told, provided that we are rendering ourselves capable of eternal life. Zosachaya, this is the animal. Now, this is, of course, an explanation of why non-kosher food is bad for us. There's the flip side of this. If non-kosher food is bad for you, because it has within it elements of bad character and character that's just not compatible with the divine presence, well, then the kosher food, the animals that the Torah tells us are good for us, they must be spiritually good for us as well. And they can create the environment for the divine presence to rest. Now, we know that there are a variety of of signs that render an animal kosher or not kosher. For an animal to be kosher, it must have two signs. It must have split hooves, cloven hooves, and it must re-chew its cud. Now, to us, this sounds totally arbitrary. So, if the foot is shaped like this, then it's kosher, or at least it has a kosher sign. If it's shaped like that, well, then it's not kosher. And if it happens to have this characteristic that it re-chews its cud, it eats the food, and it goes through the internal system, and then it, it expels it out again into its mouth and chews it again, eats it twice... That is the second sign. To us, again, it sounds totally arbitrary. But the commentaries tell us there are some secrets behind it. So let's go a bit deeper, deep and deeper. The first thing we're told, if an animal has a split hoof, so there's one side and the other side, there's there's a duality. A split hoof, we discover, it symbolizes two different existences. It's not just one singular hoof. It's two. And that's to indicate that this has a spiritual component in it because it reminds us of the two worlds. This world and the next world. The physical world and the spiritual world. Oh, and then the animal chews its cud, it eats it once, and then it eats it twice. And that's to indicate that the consumption, so to speak, of life is on two dimensions, on two levels here and there, this world and the next world, the physical world and the spiritual world. And then we learn more. If an animal has 
a split hoof. That's a, like a weakening of the hoof. If it has one, it's all united, it's like, uh, it's very powerful. It's more powerful. If it's split, then it's weaker. The commentaries tell us that an animal that has a singular hoof, is it hoof or hoof? Why is it hoof, singular, and hooves? It's a hand, okay? It's a hand or a foot. If it's singular, that makes it strong and unified, and that can be used to trample other animals and to kill them. And animals that trample and eat other animals, they're thieves. They get their food from others. A kosher animal, it has a split hoof. It's not, it's not capable of trampling other animals. And therefore, when it eats, it's not stealing. And therefore, a kosher animal, the sign of a kosher animal is that it has a split hoof. And the non-kosher animal, well, that has a singular hoof. And then we read about the rechewing of its cud. You have food. You want more. So you may think, well, let me look elsewhere. Let me get some more food. Or you take what you already have and you find a way to enjoy that. A lot of us, we, you know, we look for experiences outside our existing domain. I always tell my kids, you know, we, we, we have so many toys in our house. Let's just go shopping in our playroom. There's so much toys there. But no, you want to go to Target. You want to go to Amazon and buy new stuff, right? There's a tendency that we have for that. The animal that reaches is this cut. It wants to eat more, okay, but it finds something it already has within it and it is able to enjoy that. And that's a lesson for us. That's a sign of kosher. To be happy with what you have. You ate the food and you're happy. You don't need to go look elsewhere. You can find a way to enjoy what you already enjoyed once. And this, of course, is a very powerful lesson for us as well. We have so much. Most of us are fortunate enough to be able to see. If you're listening to this, I know for sure you're able to hear, at least, at least to some degree. You have a gift. And you think to be happy, you need the Lamborghini. And you think you need to be happy, you need to go to Italy and go vacation. Nothing wrong with that, per se. But we have to be happy with what we have. And we don't have to look elsewhere to be happy. The great Rabbi Miller used to visit hospitals just to, just to go to the elevator and just to look at all the different wards. And here, if you have this problem, kidney problem and liver problem and heart failure and all sorts of problems, he, you just see a list of all these terrible things that you don't have, all these terrible maladies, illnesses that you don't have. And that makes you happy. And the animal, the animal is a great lesson to this. You have your food. Okay. You want to chew a little more? You still have it. Chew it again. Be happy with what you already have. You don't always have to look outside of you to find something to be joyous about. And these are the symbols of the kosher animal. And the animals that are not kosher don't have these. And these characteristics are embedded in these animals. And that's when we eat these animals, we're hopefully imbibing within ourselves these characteristics as well. And thus, if non-kosher animals, well, that will push us away, will render us not a candidate for the divine presence, these qualities will render us into candidates for the, for the divine presence to rest upon us. So there's some lessons for us. We have the split hooves, this world and the next world, the reaching is cut, this world and the next world. What makes a person worthy of the divine presence? To realize that you're a soul. To realize that you have an eternal component within you. To realize that you're going to live on the spiritual dimension. The animals that steal, they always look for others to trample and to destroy with their single powerful hoof, not kosher. If we're trampling on others, if we're trying to take from others, if we're, God forbid, stealing from others, we're not a candidate for the divine presence. Of course, if we say, the money gives us whatever I need, and I don't need to look outside of myself to find happiness and joy and contentment. That is a characteristic that makes us worthy of the divine presence. I had a chat with my father-in-law. 
a week ago. And as you know, I mentioned this last week, my youngest sister-in-law, Tova, she got engaged. And uh, actually, we dedicated last week's Par- Parsha podcast in honor of her and her fiancé, Manny. And then I said, I had this whole little bit where I said, well, he's not going to listen to it anyhow, so I can say whatever I want. So she tells me this week, she's like, well, I, I did play it for Manny. And then he said, you know what? He's absolutely right. I'm not going to listen to the podcast. So I can say whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. Then no one's going to listen. So I had a chat with my father-in-law. I said, well, you're about to make a wedding for your, for your youngest daughter. This is the eighth of your eight children. And they're all married. All seem to be happy. What an accomplishment. So I told him, what an, what an incredible accomplishment. So he's like, I'm going to give you a little sneak peek on my speech that I'm preparing for the celebration, for the wedding celebration. I said, I'm not going to share with anyone that's going to be there. <laughs> but I didn't, say I'm, I'm not, I didn't say I'm not going to say on the podcast. So just do me a favor. If you happen to be there when he gives the speech, pretend like it's the first time you've heard it. It's our little secret. You know, we're more than 45 minutes into the podcast. It's very unlikely that anyone's going to be there that's going to hear this. So he said something very powerful. He says, when I bow down for Modim, at the end of the prayer, the Amidah prayer, we have a blessing. Modim, we give thanks to the Almighty, and we're supposed to bow our head as low as we can go in appreciation for all the gifts that the Almighty gives us. He tells me, when I bow down for Modim, I have a hard time getting up. I'm so appreciative of all that the Almighty did for me and does for me. I, I, I just, I want, I want to just go down again and stay down to thank the Almighty for his kindness. Which I thought was a very powerful, powerful statement. Sorry for killing the speech for you. But that's the idea. A lot of people say, well, I can't be happy because I don't have this, I don't have that, I don't have that. That is an attitude of the animal that does not chew its cud. And the animal chews its cud, that's the animal that says, I'm happy with what I have. I have more, I have less, I'm happy. And I'm bowing down my head to say modim, no matter what the circumstances. Now I want to add maybe another wrinkle to this. Recycling. When you use something and then you use it again, you reuse it, you rewash it, you recycle it. There's something to be said about the fact that there's an animal, there are many animals, that when they eat something once, they eat it again. <laughs> they bring it back up into the mouth. They chew it again and they swallow it a second time. These animals, the kosher animals, they re-chew their cud. And that tells us that with respect to food, or that demonstrates that with respect to food, they're okay to recycle. In our lives, we all have areas, areas of our life, where we do things and we recycle it. Where there's not necessarily Novelty. And then there are areas in life where we always want to find something new. You can almost know everything you need to know about a person if you discover the areas, which areas are they okay with same old, same old, and which areas must be new and fresh and exciting. Some people are just, they recoil, recoil at the idea of buying a used car. I'm going to buy a car that someone else used. That's unconscionable. New new clothing, right? We all want to wear new clothing. It's very hard for us to be okay with wearing someone else's clothing. You don't want to wear someone else's shoes, right? But what if it's last year's model, right? It's not. It was in style last year, but it's so out of style now. A lot of us, we have a tendency to say we need to have a new house, a new car, new style, new clothing. It's got to be new. And when it comes to Torah, when it comes to mitzvot, when it comes to prayer, that it's okay if it's always the same it always was. I think that this shows a, a prior, a priority, an emphasis on the physical domain to the exclusion of the spiritual domain. The Torah tells us in many places 
that every single time we do a mitzvah, we should try to find a way to do it with a sense of novelty as if it's the first time we've done it. As if today we were at Sinai and today we heard the Almighty telling us to do this in this mitzvah. The first time you do something, it's exciting. There's a sense of freshness and novelty to it. You do it 10,000 times, it's not as exciting. The Torah is telling us that when it comes to matters of the soul, we should try to seek novelty, excitement, pizzazz. To not just do things out of habit, out of rote. When it comes to food, eh, it's okay if we're recycling a little bit. It's okay if we're chewing what we chewed before. That perhaps is another element, another secret behind the the characteristic of the animal rechewing its cud. It's food. What difference does it make? Okay, we've, I've, I've chewed it before. It, it tastes kind of similar. ABC gum. That was a joke we used to say as kids. That's okay. And maybe that's why, another reason why this characteristic is something which can propel us, which can render us worthy of, of life. What can I say? I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. I have like more segments. I have this whole long segment about the four half kosher animals and why they are the epitome of unholiness and how the four hybrids correspond to the four exiles and why our exile corresponds to the pig. Oh, wow. All these interesting lessons. But alas, it's already been 50 minutes. We're going to put this back into our notes so I have something to say next year. I think we got, we got enough. We got enough for one session here. From the Torch on the Houston, Texas, on the Parsha Podcast, year eight of the Parsha Podcast, Parsha's Shemini, spiritual cholesterol. We learned about the importance, the imperative of kosher food. This enables us to have the pathways, the spiritual pathways through which all of our spiritual life can pass through. This is very important. And now we know why. I thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy this at least as much, or maybe 10% as much as I enjoyed it. I thank you for your attention, for your time, for your listenership, for your friendship. I want to wish you to have a wonderful day, a splendid rest of your week, and a sensational, inspiring, invigorating, uplifting Shabbos upcoming. And please don't help me, Almighty. We'll talk again next week. And of course, my email address is Rabbi Wolby at gmail.com.